Okay, so um, full disclosure, um, I am not the primary person on this part of the project, but um, I uh, said I would present. Uh, so Chris Bry is the agronomist on our team at the University of Arkansas, and he is really the, the leader of this part of the project. Um, my role on this part of the project was really to work with him to provide him with electrochemically precipitated struvite to be able to compare to other fertilizer sources uh, across his different studies. So um, I'll go quickly through this since we've already really talked about the background of this project, but really we're concerned with phosphorus and we're interested in recycling phosphorus in compounds that can be used directly as fertilizers. And so the the goal with all of the agronomy studies that I'll sort of walk through, he's got a really nice overview in this presentation of all the different things that they've worked on. Um, but the goal is really to compare to a range of commercially available fertilizer sources to try to demonstrate that a recycled fertilizer source can be competitive from the agronomy standpoint in terms of um, you know, soil characteristics, release, um, and crop growth. So um, we, uh, in this study, he's compared to several different fertilizer sources, as I mentioned. So triple superphosphate, monoammonium uh, phosphate, diammonium phosphate, and rock phosphate. Um, we are comparing to struvite. So we actually got a um, huge batch of um, chemically precipitated struvite from Ostara which is uh, one of the companies that's producing struvite pellets uh, and their pellets look like this. So they come in like, they're really nice sort of pelletized, but that is uh, chemically precipitated struvite from real wastewater sources. Ostara's plants are primarily municipal wastewater treatment plants right now. And then of course our electrochemically precipitated struvite. So we started out with synthetic wastewaters in the lab and then have progressed to real wastewater sources to make electrochemically precipitated struvite. And so we have not been doing pelleting, um, pelletizing. Uh, so our electrochemically precipitated struvite looks more like this, um, but it is a dry white powder that could be pelletized. And um, we've actually tested in a range of soils. So laboratories studies focused on plantless soil incubations. Um, we use soils from Arkansas, Missouri, and Nebraska, and the range of fertilizer sources, sources and looked at both moist and flooded um, moisture regimes. He also did a column leaching study, um, again, with the three different soils and fertilizer sources. And then um, I don't think we're completely finished with the rain simulation study, but we're doing a rainfall runoff simulation study um, again, with the, the different soils and fertilizer sources, and then the water is actually, we're comparing to rain that they collected, groundwater, and then wastewater that went through the struvite treatment step, and so could be considered to be a treated, recovered water source. For greenhouse studies, um, we did a potted plant study. Um, we're looking at, we were looking at corn, corn and soybean for, um, for optimal soil test P. We also did a low soil test P study there. We looked at corn, soybean, and wheat, uh, and the three different soils. Um, and then we also, um, and this one is actually ongoing. They did the first greenhouse gas emission study last summer. And I think they're doing another one this summer, um, but they're looking at rice and two different irrigation regimes and looking at, I think, both methane and N2O um, emissions. In addition to all of that, we've also been doing field studies. So the goal here was to really look at um, corn, soybean and rice uh, and look at the agronomic response to struvite as compared to the commercially available fertilizer sources. So he, um, Chris, this is actually completed. They did a two year crop rotation field study uh, in Arkansas. They did a wheat soybean double crop rotation with both furrow irrigated and dry land irrigation and um, several different fertilizer sources. And then they did two, a two year monoculture field study um, and you can see the pictures here, but they looked at our electrochemically precipitated struvite with a number of other fertilizers sources. And um, there's a picture of me actually just graduated with his PhD. And then finally they are doing, and I believe this is ongoing as well, 
um, an actual field greenhouse gas emissions study. Uh, and so you can see they're um, set up there and they're doing greenhouse gas emissions from rice uh, and looking at <clears throat> several of our um, several of the fertilizer sources along with the electrochemically precipitated. And you can see here, he's got this subscript real. Um, so we tend to use real for wastewater sources that were actually from natural occurring as opposed to us making them synthetically in the lab. So anything that has a subscript real is we actually made our struvite from a wastewater source that we got either from an agricultural wastewater or a municipal wastewater. What have we learned from the agronomy standpoint? So in terms of the um, laboratory soil incubations, yes, yeah, soil incubation. So plantless, um, just the soil incubation. So these, this study was pretty interesting because I think when we started this work, we, you know, struvite is sort of touted as the slow release um, fertilizer. And so we were really looking to see if we would see that in our um, lab studies and greenhouse studies. And, and generally we really have not seen that the struvites that we've used are necessarily slow release. Um, so that was one of the big conclusions here. Um, and then generally we didn't see large differences in the water soluble um, phosphorus uh, across the different fertilizers used as compared to the electrochemically precipitated struvite. So in terms of the rainfall um, simulations, and this is actually an ongoing study. So the really we still have work to do in terms of the data analysis. So he's just showing one aspect of the data. So in this graph, all of the strew, all of the fertilizer results are actually combined. So it's these, these bars are an average of all of the fertilizer types. But what he's showing here is that across the four different soil types and the three different rainwater sources, so rainwater, groundwater, and wastewater that we tested, we did not see a huge difference in water source in terms of the nitrate plus nitrite concentrations. Um, so this data set is suggesting that if you were to use a, a treated, you know, recycled wastewater for um, irrigation, that you wouldn't risk uh, having increased, you know, for example, nitrate and nitrite concentrations. Um, the data are not shown, but in red, he's saying that preliminarily, the results suggest that if you're using a recycled fertilizer like struvite, it also doesn't appear to have any additional environmental risk in terms of, you know, impacts like uh, nitrate and nitrate concentration. So in terms of the greenhouse studies, um, I'll just get through, get all the text up here. So in terms of soybean and corn, um, we did see differences in among the fertilizer um, sources. However, in terms of rice, we did not see huge differences across the different fertilizer sources. Um, and again, generally similar plant response for both types of struvite. So the chemically precipitated struvite and the electrochemically precipitated struvite as compared to other fertilizer phosphorus sources um, for, for multiple of the crops. And really, I think the big take home for us, is, this was a really a positive outcome to show that if you're using struvite, you can expect to see the same crop response as if you're using a commercially purchased for, um, struvite. So in terms of the, the initial results for the, the greenhouse gas emission study that they're doing, and this was in the greenhouse. Um, so the graphs on the right, so the top graph is methane and the bottom graph is uh, nitrous oxide. And the, the red is electrochemically precipitated struvite and the blue is diammonium phosphate. And so what you can see here is that both for methane emissions and the N2O, um, we actually see a higher emissions um, level from the commercial phosphorus source as compared to struvite. So these are definitely preliminary and I, they're doing repeats, but it does suggest that it's possible that a recycled fertilizer like struvite could actually lower your emissions footprint um, as compared to a commercially available fertilizer. Okay, so in terms of the field studies, um, so this was corn and rice, uh, corn, rice and soybean across two years, 2019 and 2020. And um, 
One of the big take homes that we saw here is with the corn. So corn was the only crop that we saw that actually had an increased yield uh, with electrochemically precipitated struvite as compared to the other fertilizer sources. Um, the other two um, crops, the electrochemically precipitated struvite and the chemically precipitated struvite had similar results in terms of crop yield. Uh, okay, and then we've got a bunch of next steps here. So ongoing work in this project, um, this project is gonna go probably another two years or so. And so really what Chris has gotten into more recently is using some of our samples from electrochemically precipitated through right from real wastewaters as opposed to synthetic waters that we used in the lab, um, looking at both wastewater treatment plant and animal waste waters. Um, and the goal is to continue evaluating crop response and field testing. And he also is very interested in the, these initial greenhouse gas emissions results. So they're doing more testing both in the greenhouse and out in the field this summer for that. Um, and then Chris works really closely with our economics team. And so they have, are on, have ongoing work in trying to link the agronomic response with the economics of using a recycled fertilizer like struvite as opposed to using chemical um, phosphorus fertilizers. Overall, um, we have seen that both electrochemically precipitated struvite and chemically precipita precipitated struvite can, be, can result in similar soil behavior and similar agronomic response. With corn, we actually did see an enhanced response, which is, which is interesting. Um, but we were really pleased to see that sort of at a, at a minimum, we think that these recycled fertilizer sources as struvite can actually be a competitor, possible replacement for the commercially available phosphorus that people are using. Um, and then the, the, the GHG work is fairly new in the project, but is really interesting and exciting, I think, for the team that these recycled fertilizers may also have a positive impact in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions um, in fields like, for example, for rice production. So with that, I will try to answer your questions. I'm not an agronomist um, and we can always email Chris if you have detailed questions. So he separated them. So some of them were deficient and some of them were not. And he tracked that. I don't know which ones were which off the top of my head, but it, that is definitely something that we looked that we looked at really at the beginning of the project is um, deficient versus not deficient. So it's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I have asked Chris this myself. Um, and I don't know if I actually, I don't know if he fully understands it yet. And I don't know that I can even tell you quite what he's thinking. We should definitely ask him as I know they were pleasantly surprised to see the results and really interested in this aspect of, of using potentially using recycled fertilizer products. Um, yeah, sorry. Good question. <laughs> yeah.